Dramatis Personae of Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Narrator, read by Christine Lehman. Joe Bear, read by Marianne Spiegel. Dan Keen, read by Thomas Peter. Emil Hoffman, read by George Allen. Demi Brooke, read by McKinney Lee Sizemore. Ted Bear, read by Alex Freeds. Josie Brooke, read by Twinkle. Bess, read by Esther Benseminides. Mrs. Meg Brooke, read by Beth Thomas. Mr. Laurie Lawrence, read by Romano. Fritz Bear, read by Paul Simonon. Nate, read by James Curran. Daisy Brooke, read by Rachel. Tom Bangs, read by Todd. Rob Bear, read by Kangaroo. Nan, read by Adele de Pignoles. Alice Heath, read by Lian Yao. Dolly Pettingill, read by Alex Inigo. Mary Hardy, read by Cheryl Holmes, M.D. Miss Cameron, read by Michelle Kane. Franz, read by Kangaroo. Stuffy Cole, read by Will Nestle. Mr. March, read by Delmar H. Dolbear. Voice 1, read by J. L. Baldwin. Voice 2, read by Devorah Allen. Voice 3, read by Barbara Ann Scott. Amy Lawrence, read by Hannah Mary. Mary the Maid, read by Laura Riley. Lady in Black, read by Lian Yao. The Reporter, read by James Curran. Miss Burton, Read by Rachel Lundstrom. Miss Pearson. Read by Julie Barkley. Miss Winthrop. Read by Laura Riley. Nellie. Read by Rachel Lundstrom. Sally. Read by Brenda Davidson. Millie. Read by Lian Yao. Mrs. Parmalee. Read by Rachel Lundstrom. Youngest Parmalee daughter. Read by Starling Reader. Middle Parmalee Daughter, read by Lian Yao. Oldest Parmalee Daughter, read by Brenda Davidson. Chaplain, read by Drew Johnson. Frau Tetzel, read by Kalinda. Fräulein Vogelstein, read by Sonja. Lady Abercrombie, read by Diane Alla Elima. Warden, read by Chi Sing Lee. Marmy, read by Rachel Lundstrom. Dr. Morrison, read by Delmar H. Dolbeer. Dr. Watkins, read by Recording Person. Captain Hardy, read by Delmar H. Dolbeer. Mrs. Hardy, read by Stacy Simon. Surgeon, read by M. Lichardello. Blair, read by Alex Inigo. Sharper, read by M. Lichardello. German Student, read by David Olson. Mina Schomburg. Read by Eva Davis. Maria, read by Rachel Lundstrom. Maria's mother, read by Trudy B. Voice. Per Bergman, read by Shasta. Ned Barker, read by Asher Gravi. Stout Lady, read by Rachel Lundstrom. End of Dramatis Personae. Chapter One of Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter One Ten Years Later. If anyone had told me what wonderful changes were to take place here in ten years, I wouldn't have believed it, said Mrs. Joe to Mrs. Meg, as they sat on the piazza at Plumfield one summer day, looking about them with faces full of pride and pleasure. This is the sort of magic that money and kind hearts can work. I am sure Mr. Lawrence could have no nobler monument than the college he so generously endowed, and a home like this will keep Aunt March's memory green as long as it lasts answered mrs meg always glad to praise the absent we used to believe in fairies you remember 
and plan what we'd ask for if we could have three wishes? Doesn't it seem as if mine had been really granted at last? Money, fame, and plenty of the work I love, said Mrs. Joe, carelessly rumpling up her hair as she clasped her hands over her head, just as she used to do when a girl. I have had mine, and Amy is enjoying hers to her heart's content. If dear Mammy, John, and Beth were here, it would be quite perfect, added Meg, with a tender quiver in her voice, for Marmy's place was empty now. Joe put her hand on her sister's, and both sat silent for a little while, surveying the pleasant scene before them with mingled sad and happy thoughts. It certainly did look as if magic had been at work, for quiet Plumfield was transformed into a busy little world. The house seemed more hospitable than ever, refreshed now with new paint, added wings, well-kept lawn and garden, and a prosperous air it had not worn when riotous boys swarmed everywhere, and it was rather difficult for the bears to make both ends meet. On the hill, where kites used to be flown, stood the fine college which Mr. Lawrence's munificent legacy had built. Busy students were going to and fro along the paths once trodden by childish feet, and many young men and women were enjoying all the advantages that wealth, wisdom, and benevolence could give them. Just inside the gates of Plumfield, a pretty brown cottage, very like the dovecote, nestled among the trees, and on the green slope westward, Laurie's white-pillared mansion glittered in the sunshine. For when the rapid growth of the city shut in the old house, spoilt Meg's nest, and dared to put a soap factory under Mr. Lawrence's indignant nose, our friends emigrated to Plumfield, and the great changes began. These were the pleasant ones, and the loss of the dear old people was sweetened by the blessings they left behind, so all prospered now in the little community, and Mr. Bear as president, and Mr. March as chaplain of the college, saw their long-cherished dream beautifully realized. The sisters divided the care of the young people among them, each taking the part that suited her best meg was the motherly friend of the young women joe the confidant and defender of all the youth and amy the lady bountiful who delicately smoothed the way for needy students and entertained them all so cordially that it was no wonder they named her lovely home mount parnassus so full was it of music beauty and the culture hungry young hearts and fancies long for the original twelve boys had, of course, scattered far and wide during these years, but all that lived still remembered old Plumfield, and came wandering back from the four quarters of the earth to tell their various experiences, laugh over the pleasures of the past, and face the duties of the present with fresh courage, for such homecomings keep hearts tender and hands helpful with the memories of young and happy days. A few words will tell the history of each, and then we can go on with the new chapter of their lives franz was with a merchant kinsman in hamburg a man of twenty-six now and doing well emile was the jolliest tar that ever sailed the ocean blue his uncle sent him on a long voyage to disgust him with this adventurous life but he came home so delighted with it that it was plain this was his profession and the german kinsman gave him a good chance in his ships so the lad was happy Dan was a wanderer still, for after the geological researches in South America, he tried sheep farming in Australia, and was now in California looking up mines. Nat was busy with music at the conservatory, preparing for a year or two in Germany to finish him off. Tom was studying medicine and trying to like it. Jack was in business with his father, bent on getting rich. Dolly was in college with Stuffy and Ned reading law. Poor little Dick was dead, so was Billy, and no one could mourn for them, since life would never be happy, afflicted as they were in mind and body. 
rob and teddy were called the lion and the lamb for the latter was as rampant as the king of beasts and the former as gentle as any sheep that ever bawed mrs joe called him my daughter and found him the most dutiful of children with plenty of manliness underlying the quiet manners and tender nature but in ted she seemed to see all the faults whims aspirations and fun of her own youth in a new shape with his tawny locks always in wild confusion his long legs and arms loud voice and continual activity ted was a prominent figure at plumfield he had his moods of gloom and fell into the slow of despond about once a week to be hoisted out by patient rob or his mother who understood when to let him alone and when to shake him up he was her pride and joy as well as torment being a very bright lad for his age and so full of all sorts of budding talent that her maternal mind was much exercised as to what this remarkable boy would become demi had gone through college with honor and mrs meg had set her heart on his being a minister picturing in her fond fancy the first sermon her dignified young parson would preach as well as the long useful and honored life he was to lead but john as she called him now firmly declined the divinity school saying he had had enough of books and needed to know more of men and the world and caused the dear woman much disappointment by deciding to try a journalist's career it was a blow but she knew that young minds cannot be driven and that experience is the best teacher so she let him follow his own inclinations still hoping to see him in the pulpit aunt joe raged when she found that there was to be a reporter in the family and called him jenkins on the spot she liked his literary tendencies but had reason to detest official paul Pry's, as we shall see later demi knew his own mind however and tranquilly carried out his plans unmoved by the tongues of the anxious mammas or the jokes of his mates uncle teddy encouraged him and painted a splendid career mentioning dickens and other celebrities who began as reporters and ended as famous novelists or newspaper men the girls were all flourishing daisy as sweet and domestic as ever was her mother's comfort and companion josie at fourteen was a most original young person full of pranks and peculiarities the latest of which was a passion for the stage which caused her quiet mother and sister much anxiety as well as amusement bess had grown into a tall beautiful girl looking several years older than she was with the same graceful ways and dainty tastes which the little princess had and a rich inheritance of both the father's and mother's gifts fostered by every aid love and money could give but the pride of the community was naughty nan for like so many restless wilful children she was growing into a woman full of the energy and promise that suddenly blossoms when the ambitious seeker finds the work she is fitted to do well nan began to study medicine at sixteen and at twenty was getting on bravely for now thanks to other intelligent women colleges and hospitals were open to her she had never wavered in her purpose from the childish days when she shocked daisy in the old willow by saying i don't want any family to fuss over i shall have an office with bottles and pestle things in it and drive round and cure folks the future foretold by the little girl the young woman was rapidly bringing to pass and finding so much happiness in it that nothing could win her from the chosen work several worthy young gentlemen had tried to make her change her mind and choose as daisy did a nice little house and family to take care of but nan only laughed and routed the lovers by proposing to look at the tongue which spoke of adoration or professionally felt the pulse in the manly hand offered for her acceptance so all departed but one persistent youth who was such a devoted traddles it was impossible to quench him 
this was tom who was as faithful to his child sweetheart as she to her pestle things and gave a proof of fidelity that touched her very much he studied medicine for her sake alone having no taste for it and a decided fancy for a mercantile life but nan was firm and tom stoutly kept on devoutly hoping he might not kill many of his fellow-beings when he came to practice they were excellent friends however and caused much amusement to their comrades by the vicissitudes of this merry love chase both were approaching plumfield on the afternoon when mrs meg and mrs joe were talking on the piazza not together for nan was walking briskly along the pleasant road alone thinking over a case that interested her and tom was pegging on behind to overtake her as if by accident when the suburbs of the city were passed a little way of his which was part of the joke nan was a handsome girl with a fresh color clear eye quick smile and the self-poised look young women with a purpose always have she was simply and sensibly dressed walked easily and seemed full of vigor with her broad shoulders well back arms swinging freely and the elasticity of youth and health in every motion the few people she met turned to look at her as if it was a pleasant sight to see a hearty happy girl walking countryward that lovely day and the red-faced young man steaming along behind hat off and every tight curl wagging with impatience evidently agreed with them presently a mild hello was borne upon the breeze and pausing with an effort to look surprised that was an utter failure nan said affably oh is that you tom looks like it thought you might be walking out today and tom's jovial face beamed with pleasure you knew it how is your throat asked nan in her professional tone which was always a quencher to undue raptures throat oh ah yes i remember it is well the effect of that prescription was wonderful i'll never call homeopathy a humbug again you were the humbug this time and so were the unmedicated pellets i gave you if sugar or milk can cure diphtheria in this remarkable manner i'll make a note of it oh tom tom will you never be done playing tricks oh nan nan will you never be done getting the better of me and the merry pair laughed at one another just as they did in the old times which always came back freshly when they went to plumfield well i knew i shouldn't see you for a week if i didn't scare up some excuse for a call at the office you are so desperately busy all the time i never get a word explained tom you ought to be busy too and above such nonsense really tom if you don't give your mind to your lectures you'll never get on said nan soberly i have quite enough of them as it is answered tom with an air of disgust a fellow must lark a bit after dissecting corpuses all day i can't stand it long at a time though some people seem to enjoy it immensely then why not leave it and do what suits you better i always thought it a foolish thing you know said nan with a trace of anxiety in the keen eyes that searched for signs of illness in a face as ruddy as a baldwin apple you know why i chose it and why i shall stick to it if it kills me i may not look delicate but i've a deep-seated heart complaint and it will carry me off sooner or later for only one doctor in the world can cure it and she won't there was an air of pensive resignation about tom that was both comic and pathetic for he was in earnest and kept on giving hints of this sort without the least encouragement nan frowned but she was used to it and knew how to treat him she is curing it in the best and only way but a more refractory patient never lived did you go to that ball as i directed i did and devote yourself to pretty miss west danced with her the whole evening no impression made on that susceptible organ of yours not in the slightest i gaped in her face once forgot to feed her and gave a sigh of relief when i handed her over to her mamma repeat the dose as often as possible and note the symptoms i predict that you'll cry for it by and by never i'm sure it doesn't suit my constitution we shall see obey orders sternly yes doctor meekly 
silence reigned for a moment then as if the bone of contention was forgotten in the pleasant recollections called up by familiar objects nan said suddenly what fun we used to have in that wood do you remember how you tumbled out of the big nut tree and nearly broke your collar bones don't i and how you steeped me in wormwood till i was a fine mahogany color and aunt joe wailed over my spoiled jacket laughed tom a boy again in a minute and how you set the house afire and you ran off for your bandbox do you ever say thunder turtles now do people ever call you giddy gaddy daisy does dear thing i haven't seen her for a week i saw demi this morning and he said she was keeping home for mother bar she always does when aunt joe gets into a vortex daisy is a model housekeeper and you couldn't do better than make your bow to her if you can't go to work and wait till you're grown up before you begin lovering nat would break his fiddle over my head if i suggested such a thing no thank you another name is engraved upon my heart as indelibly as the blue anchor on my arm hope is my motto and no surrender yours see who will hold out the longest you silly boys think we must pair off as we did when children but we shall do nothing of the kind how well parnassus looks from here said nan abruptly changing the conversation again it is a fine house but i love old plum best wouldn't aunt march stare if she could see the changes here answered tom as they both paused at the great gate to look at the pleasant landscape before them a sudden whoop startled them as a long boy with a wild yellow head came leaping over a hedge like a kangaroo followed by a slender girl who stuck in the hawthorn and sat there laughing like a witch a pretty little lass she was with curly dark hair bright eyes and a very expressive face her hat was at her back and her skirts a good deal the worse for the brooks she had crossed the trees she had climbed and the last leap which added several fine rents take me down nan please tom hold ted he's got my book and i will have it called josie from her perch not at all daunted by the appearance of her friends tom promptly collared the thief while nan picked josie from among the thorns and set her on her feet without a word of reproof for having been a romp in her own girlhood she was very indulgent to like tastes in others what's the matter dear she asked pinning up the longest rip while josie examined the scratches on her hands i was studying my part in the willow and ted came slyly up and poked the book out of my hands with his rod it fell in the brook and before i could scramble down he was off you wretch give it back this moment or i'll box your ears cried josie laughing and scolding in the same breath escaping from tom ted struck a sentimental attitude and with tender glances at the wet torn young person before him delivered claude melnotte's famous speech in a lackadaisical way that was irresistibly funny ending with dost like the picture love as he made an object of himself by tying his long legs in a knot and distorting his face horribly the sound of applause from the piazza put a stop to these antics and the young folks went up the avenue together very much in the old style when tom drove four in hand and nan was the best horse in the team rosy breathless and merry they greeted the ladies and sat down on the steps to rest aunt meg sewing up her daughter's rags while mrs joe smoothed the lion's mane and rescued the book daisy appeared in a moment to greet her friend and all began to talk muffins for tea better stay and eat em daisies never fail said ted hospitably he's a judge he ate nine last time that's why he's so fat added josie with a withering glance at her cousin who was as thin as a lathe i must go and see lucy dub she has a whitlow and it's time to lance it i'll tea at college answered nan feeling in her pocket to be sure she had not forgotten her case of instruments thanks i'm going there also tom merriweather has granulated lids and i promise to touch em up for him save a doctor's fee it'd be a good practice for me i'm clumsy with my thumbs said tom bound to be near his idol while he could hush daisy doesn't like to hear you saw bones talk of your work 
muffins suit us better and ted grinned sweetly with a view to future favors in the eating line any news of the commodore asked tom he's on his way home and dan hopes to come soon i long to see my boys together and have begged the wanderers to come to thanksgiving if not before answered mrs joe beaming at the thought they'll come every man of them if they can even jack will risk losing a dollar for the sake of one of our jolly old dinners laughed tom there's the turkey fattening for the feast i never chase him now but feed him well and he's swelling visibly bless his drumsticks said ted pointing out the doomed fowl proudly parading in a neighboring field if nat goes the last of the month we shall want a farewell frolic for him i suppose the dear old chirper will come home a second old bull said nan to her friend a pretty color came into daisy's cheek and the folds of muslin on her breast rose and fell with a quick breath but she answered placidly uncle lorry says he has real talent and after the training he will get abroad he can command a good living here though he may never be famous young people seldom turn out as one predicts so it is of little use to expect anything said mrs meg with a sigh if our children are good and useful men and women we should be satisfied yet it's very natural to wish them to be brilliant and successful they are like my chickens mighty uncertain now that fine-looking cockerel of mine is the stupidest one of the lot and the ugly long-legged chap is the king of the yard he's so smart crows loud enough to wake the seven sleepers but the handsome one croaks and is no end of a coward i get snuffed but you wait till i grow up and then see and ted looked so like his own long-legged pet that every one laughed at his modest prediction i want to see dan settled somewhere a rolling stone gathers no moss and at twenty-five he is still roaming about the world without a tie to hold him except this and mrs meg nodded towards her sister dan will find his place at last and experience is the best teacher he is rough still but each time he comes home i see a change for the better and never lose my faith in him he may never do anything great or get rich but if the wild boy makes an honest man i'm satisfied said mrs joe who always defended the black sheep of her flock that's right mother stand by dan he's worth a dozen jacks and neds bragging about money and trying to be swells you see if he doesn't do something to be proud of and take the wind out of their sails added ted whose love for his danny was now strengthened by a boy's admiration for the bold adventurous man hope so i'm sure he's just the fellow to do rash things and come to glory climbing the matterhorn taking a header into niagara or finding a big nugget that's his way of sowing wild oats and perhaps it's better than ours said tom thoughtfully for he had gained a good deal of experience in that sort of agriculture since he became a medical student much better said mrs joe emphatically i'd rather send my boys off to see the world in that way than leave them alone in a city full of temptations with nothing to do but waste time money and health as so many are left dan has to work his way and that teaches him courage patience and self-reliance i don't worry about him as much as i do about george and dolly at college no more fit than two babies to take care of themselves what about john he's knocking round town as a newspaper man reporting all sorts of things from sermons to prize fights asked tom who thought that sort of life would be much more to his own taste than medical lectures and hospital wards demi has three safeguards good principles refined tastes and a wise mother he won't come to harm and these experiences will be useful to him when he begins to write as i'm sure he will in time began mrs joe in her prophetic tone for she was anxious to have some of her geese turn out swans speak of jenkins and you'll hear the rustling of his paper cried tom as a fresh-faced brown-eyed young man came up the avenue waving a newspaper over his head here's your evening tattler latest edition awful murder bank clerk absconded powder mill explosion and great strike of the latin schoolboys 
roared ted going to meet his cousin with the graceful gait of a young giraffe the commodore is in and will cut his cable and run before the wind as soon as he can get off called demi with a nice derangement of nautical epitaphs as he came up smiling over his good news every one talked together for a moment and the paper passed from hand to hand that each eye might rest on the pleasant fact that the brenda from hamburg was safe in port he'll come lurching out by to-morrow with his usual collection of marine monsters and lively yarns i saw him jolly and terry and brown as a coffee berry had a good run and hopes to be second mate as the other chap is laid up with a broken leg added demi wish i had the setting of it said nan to herself with a professional twist of her hand how's franz asked mrs joe he's going to be married there's news for you the first of the flock auntie so say good-bye to him her name is ludmilla heldegard blumenthal good family well off pretty and of course an angel the dear old boy wants uncle's consent and then he will settle down to be a happy and an honest burgher long life to him i'm glad to hear it i do so like to settle my boys with a good wife and a nice little home now if it's all right i shall feel as if franz was off my mind said mrs joe folding her hands contentedly for she often felt like a distracted hen with a large brood of mixed chickens and ducks upon her hands so do i sighed tom with a sly glance at nan that's what a fellow needs to keep him steady and it's the duty of nice girls to marry as soon as possible isn't it demi if there are enough nice fellows to go round the female population exceeds the male you know especially in new england which accounts for the high state of culture we are in perhaps answered john who was leaning over his mother's chair telling his day's experiences in a whisper it is a merciful provision my dears for it takes three or four women to get each man into through and out of the world you are costly creatures boys and it is well that mothers sisters wives and daughters love their duty and do it so well or you would perish off the face of the earth said mrs joe solemnly as she took up a basket filled with dilapidated hose for the good professor was still hard on his socks and his sons resembled him in that respect such being the case there's plenty for the superfluous women to do in taking care of these helpless men and their families i see that more clearly every day and am very glad and grateful that my profession will make me a useful happy and independent spinster nan's emphasis on the last word caused tom to groan and the rest to laugh i take great pride and solid satisfaction in you nan and hope to see you very successful for we do need just such helpful women in the world i sometimes feel as if i've missed my vocation and ought to have remained single but my duty seems to point this way and i don't regret it said mrs joe folding a large and very ragged blue sock to her bosom neither do i what should i have ever done without my dearest mum added ted with a filial hug which caused both to disappear behind the newspaper in which he had been mercifully absorbed for a few minutes my darling boy if you would wash your hands semi-occasionally fond caresses would be less disastrous to my collar never mind my precious tousle-head better grass stains and dirt than no cuddlings at all and mrs joe emerged from that brief eclipse looking much refreshed though her back hair was caught in ted's buttons and her collar under one ear here josie who had been studying her part at the other end of the piazza suddenly burst forth with a smothered shriek and gave juliet's speech in the tomb so effectively that the boys applauded daisy shivered and nan murmured too much cerebral excitement for one of her age i'm afraid you'll have to make up your mind to it meg that child is a born actress we never did anything so well not even the witch's curse said mrs joe casting a bouquet of many-coloured socks at the feet of her flushed and panting niece when she fell gracefully upon the doormat it is a sort of judgment upon me for my passion for the stage when a girl now i know how dear mamie felt when i begged to be an actress i never can consent and yet 
I may be obliged to give up my wishes, hopes, and plans again. There was an accent of reproach in his mother's voice, which made Demi pick up his sister with a gentle shake and the stern command to drop that nonsense in public. Drop me, minion, or I'll give you the maniac bride with my best ha-ha! cried Josie, glaring at him like an offended kitten. Being set on her feet, she made a splendid courtesy, and dramatically proclaiming, Mrs. Waffington's carriage waits swept down the steps and round the corner trailing daisy's scarlet shawl majestically behind her isn't she great fun i couldn't stop in this dull place if i hadn't that child to make it lively for me if she ever turns prim i'm off so mind how you nip her in the bud said teddy frowning at demi who was now writing out shorthand notes on the steps you two are a team and it takes a strong hand to drive you, but I rather like it. Josie ought to have been my child, and Rob yours, Meg. Then your whole house would have been all peace, and mine all bedlam. Now I must go and tell Laurie the news. Come with me, Meg. A little stroll will do us good. And sticking Ted's straw hat on her head, Mrs. Joe walked off with her sister, leaving Daisy to attend to the muffins, Ted to appease Josie, and Tom and Nan to give their respective patients a very bad quarter of an hour. End of chapter 1《ハッピー・ of Joe's Boys》by Louisa May Alcott。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Joe's Boys》by Louisa May Alcott。Chapter Two。Parnassus。It was well named, and the muses seemed to be at home that day. For as the newcomers went up the slope, appropriate sights and sounds greeted them. Passing an open window, they looked in upon a library presided over by Cleo, Calliope, and Urania. Melpomene and Thalia were disporting themselves in the hall, where some young people were dancing and rehearsing a play. Erato was walking in the garden with her lover, and in the music-room Phoebus himself was drilling a tuneful choir. A mature Apollo was our old friend Laurie, but comely and genial as ever, for time had ripened the freakish boy into a noble man. Care and sorrow, as well as ease and happiness, had done much for him, and the responsibility of carrying out his grandfather's wishes had been a duty most faithfully performed. Prosperity suits some people, and they blossom best in a glow of sunshine. Others need the shade, and are the sweeter for a touch of frost. Laurie was one of the former sort, and Amy was another. So life had been a kind of poem to them since they married, not only harmonious and happy, but earnest, useful, and rich in the beautiful benevolence which can do so much when wealth and wisdom go hand in hand with charity their house was full of unostentatious beauty and comfort and here the art-loving host and hostess attracted and entertained artists of all kinds laurie had music enough now and was a generous patron to the class he most liked to help amy had her protégés among ambitious young painters and sculptors and found her own art double dear as her daughter grew old enough to share its labors and delights with her for she was one of those who prove that women can be faithful wives and mothers without sacrificing the special gift bestowed upon them for their own development and the good of others her sisters knew where to find her and joe went at once to the studio where mother and daughter worked together bess was busy with the bust of a little child while her mother added the last touches to a fine head of her husband 
time seemed to have stood still with amy for happiness had kept her young and prosperity given her the culture she needed a stately graceful woman who showed how elegant simplicity could be made by the taste with which she chose her dress and the grace with which she wore it as some one said i never know what mrs lawrence has on but i always receive the impression that she is the best dressed lady in the room it was evident that she adored her daughter and well she might for the beauty she had longed for seemed to her fond eyes at least to be impersonated in this younger self bess inherited her mother's diana-like figure blue eyes fair skin and golden hair tied up in the same classic knot of curls also ah never-ending source of joy to amy she had her father's handsome nose and mouth cast in a feminine mould the severe simplicity of a long linen pinafore suited her and she worked away with the entire absorption of the true artist unconscious of the loving eyes upon her till aunt jo came in exclaiming eagerly my dear girls stop your mud pies and hear the news both artists dropped their tools and greeted the irrepressible woman cordially though genius had been burning splendidly and her coming spoilt a precious hour they were in the full tide of gossip when laurie who had been summoned by meg arrived and sitting down between the sisters with no barricade anywhere listened with interest to the news of franz and emile the epidemic has broke out and now it will rage and ravage your flock be prepared for every sort of romance and rashness for the next ten years joe your boys are growing up and will plunge headlong into a sea of worse scrapes than any you have had yet said laurie enjoying her look of mingled delight and despair i know it and i hope i shall be able to pull them through and land them safely but it's an awful responsibility for they will come to me and insist that i can make their poor little loves run smoothly i like it though and meg is such a mush of sentiment that she revels in the prospect answered joe feeling pretty easy about her own boys whose youth made them safe for the present i am afraid she won't revel when our gnat begins to buzz too near her daisy of course you see what all that means as musical director i am also his confidant and would like to know what advice to give said laurie soberly hush you forget that child began joe nodding towards bess who was at work again bless you she's in athens and doesn't hear a word she ought to leave off though and go out my darling put the baby to sleep and go for a run aunt meg is in the parlor go and show her the new pictures till we come added laurie looking at his tall girl as pygmalion might have looked at galatia for he considered her the finest statue in the house yes papa but please tell me if it is good and bess obediently put down her tools with a lingering glance at the bust my cherished daughter truth compels me to confess that one cheek is plumper than the other and the curls upon its infant brow are rather too much like horns for perfect grace otherwise it rivals raphael's chanting cherubs and i'm proud of it laurie was laughing as he spoke for these first attempts were so like amy's early ones it was impossible to regard them as soberly as the enthusiastic mamma did you can't see beauty in anything but music answered bess shaking the golden head that made the one bright spot in the cool north lights of the great studio well i see beauty in you dear and if you are not art what is i wish to put a little more nature into you and get you away from this cold clay and marble into the sunshine to dance and laugh as the others do i want a flesh and blood girl not a sweet statue in a grey pinafore who forgets everything but her work as he spoke two dusty hands came round his neck and bess said earnestly punctuating her words with soft touches of her lips i never forget you papa but i do want to do something beautiful that you may be proud of me by and by 
Mamma often tells me to stop, but when we get in here we forget there is any world outside, we are so busy and so happy. Now I'll go and run and sing, and be a girl to please you. And throwing away the apron, Bess vanished from the room, seeming to take all the light with her. Oh, I'm glad you said that. The dear child is too much absorbed in her artistic dreams for one so young. It is my fault, but I sympathize so deeply in it all I forget to be wise, sighed Amy, carefully covering the baby with a wet towel. I think this power of living in our children is one of the sweetest things in the world. But I try to remember what Marmy once said to Meg, that fathers should have their share in the education of both girls and boys. So I leave Ted to his father all I can, and Fritz lends me Rob, whose quiet ways are as restful and good for me as Ted's tempests are for his father. Now I advise you, Amy, to let Bess drop the mud pies for a time, and take up music with Laurie. Then she won't be one-sided, and he won't be jealous. Hear, hear, a Daniel, a very Daniel, cried Laurie, well pleased. I thought you'd lend a hand, Joe, and say a word for me. I am a little jealous of Amy and want more of a share in my girl. Come, my lady, let me have her this summer, and next year, when we go to Rome, I will give her up to you and high art. Isn't that a fair bargain? I agree. But in trying your hobby, nature with music thrown in, don't forget that, though only fifteen, our Bess is older than most girls of that age, and cannot be treated like a child. She is so very precious to me, I feel as if I wanted to keep her always as pure and beautiful as the marble she loves so well. Amy spoke regretfully as she looked about the lovely room where she had spent so many happy hours with this dear child of hers. Turn and turn about is fair play, as we used to say, when we all wanted to ride on Ellen Tree or wear the russet boots, said Joe briskly. So you must share your girl between you and see who will do the most for her. We, we will, answered the fond parents, laughing at the recollections Joe's proverb brought up to them. How oh, I did used to enjoy bouncing on the limbs of that old apple tree. No real horse ever gave me half the pleasure or the exercise, said Amy, looking out of the high window as if she saw the dear old orchard again and the little girls at play there. And what fun I had with those blessed boots, laughed Joe. I've got the relics now. The boys reduced them to rags, but I love them still, and would enjoy a good theatrical stock in them, if it were possible. My fondest memories twine about the warming pan and the sausage. What larks we had! And how long ago it seems! said Laurie, staring at the two women before him, as if he found it hard to realize that they ever had been little Amy and riotous Joe. Don't suggest that we are growing old, my lord. We have only bloomed, and a very nice bouquet we make with our buds about us, answered Mrs. Amy, shaking out the folds of her rosy muslin with much the air of dainty satisfaction the girl used to show in a new dress. Not to mention our thorns and dead leaves, added Joe with a sigh, for life had never been very easy to her, and even now she had her troubles both within and without. Come and have a dish of tea, old dear, and see what the young folks are about. You are tired, and want to be stayed with flagons and comforted with apples, said Laurie, offering an arm to each sister and leading them away to afternoon tea, which flowed as freely on Parnassus as the nectar of old. They found Meg in the summer parlor, an airy and delightful room, full now of afternoon sunshine and the rustle of trees, for the three long windows opened on the garden. The great music room was at one end, and at the other, in a deep alcove hung with purple curtains, a little household shrine had been made. Three portraits hung there, two marble busts stood in the corners, and a couch, an oval table with its urn of flowers, were the only articles of furniture the nook contained. The busts were John Brooke and Beth, Amy's work, 
both excellent likenesses and both full of the placid beauty which always recalls the saying that clay represents life plaster death marble immortality on the right as became the founder of the house hung the portrait of mr lawrence with its expression of mingled pride and benevolence as fresh and attractive as when he caught the girl joe admiring it opposite was aunt march a legacy to amy in an imposing turban immense sleeves and long mittens decorously crossed on the front of her plum-coloured satin gown time had mellowed the severity of her aspect and the fixed regard of the handsome old gentleman opposite seemed to account for the amiable simper on lips that had not uttered a sharp word for years in the place of honour with the sunshine warm upon it and a green garland always round it was marmy's beloved face painted with grateful skill by a great artist whom she had befriended when poor and unknown so beautifully lifelike was it that it seemed to smile down upon her daughters saying cheerfully be happy i am with you still the three sisters stood a moment looking up at the beloved picture with eyes full of tender reverence and the longing that never left them for this noble mother had been so much to them that no one could ever fill her place only two years since she had gone away to live and love anew leaving such a sweet memory behind her that it was both an inspiration and a comforter to all the household they felt this as they drew closer to one another and laurie put it into words as he said earnestly i can ask nothing better for my child than that she may be a woman like our mother please god she shall be if i can do it for i owe the best i have to this dear saint just then a fresh voice began to sing ave maria in the music-room and bess unconsciously echoed her father's prayer for her as she dutifully obeyed his wishes the soft sound of the air marmy used to sing led the listeners back into the world again from that momentary reaching after the loved and lost and they sat down together near the open windows enjoying the music while lorry brought them tea making the little service pleasant by the tender care he gave to it nat came in with demi soon followed by ted and josie the professor and his faithful rob all anxious to hear more about the boys the rattle of cups and tongues grew brisk and the setting sun saw a cheerful company resting in the bright room after the varied labors of the day professor bear was gray now but robust and genial as ever for he had the work he loved and did it so heartily that the whole college felt his beautiful influence rob was as much like him as it was possible for a boy to be and was already called the young professor he so adored study and closely imitated his honored father in all ways well hearts dearest we're going to have our boys again all two and may rejoice greatly said mr bear seating himself beside joe with a beaming face and a handshake of congratulations oh fritz i'm so delighted about emil and if you approve about franz also did you know ludmilla is it a wise match asked mrs joe handing him her cup of tea and drawing closer as if she welcomed her refuge in joy as well as sorrow it all goes well i saw the matron when i went over to place franz a child then but most sweet and charming blumenthal is satisfied i think and the boy will be happy he is too german to be content away from vaterland so we shall have him as a link between the new and the old and that pleases me much and emil he is to be second mate next voyage isn't that fine i'm so happy that both your boys have done well you gave up so much for them and their mother you make light of it dear but i never forget it 
said joe with her hand in his as sentimentally as if she was a girl again and her fritz had come a-wooing he laughed his cheery laugh and whispered behind her fan if i had not come to america for the poor lads i never should have found my joe the hard times are very sweet now and i bless god for all i seem to lose because i gained the blessing of my life spooning spooning here's an awful flirtation on the sly cried teddy peering over the fan just at that interesting moment much to his mother's confusion and his father's amusement for the professor never was ashamed of the fact that he still considered his wife the dearest woman in the world rob promptly ejected his brother from one window to see him skip in at the other while mrs joe shut her fan and held it ready to wrap her unruly boy's knuckles if he came near her again nat approached in answer to mr bear's beckoning teaspoon and stood before them with a face full of the respectful affection he felt for the excellent man who had done so much for him i have the letters ready for thee my son they are two old friends of mine in leipzig who will befriend thee in that new life it is well to have them for thou wilt be heartbroken with heinweh at the first gnat and need comforting said the professor giving him several letters thanks sir yes i expect to be pretty lonely till i get started then my music and the hope of getting on will cheer me up answered nat who both longed and dreaded to leave all these friends behind him and make new ones he was a man now but the blue eyes were as honest as ever the mouth still a little weak in spite of the carefully cherished moustache over it and the broad forehead more plainly than ever betrayed the music-loving nature of the youth modest affectionate and dutiful nat was considered a pleasant though not a brilliant success by mrs joe she loved and trusted him and was sure he would do his best but did not expect that he would be great in any way unless the stimulus of foreign training and self-dependence made him a better artist and a stronger man than now seemed likely i've marked all your things or rather daisy did and as soon as your books are collected we can see about the packing said mrs joe who was so used to fitting boys off for all quarters of the globe that a trip to the north pole would not have been too much for her nat grew red at mention of that name or was it the last glow of sunset on his rather pale cheek and his heart beat happily at the thought of the dear girl working ends and bees on his humble socks and handkerchiefs for nat adored daisy and the cherished dream of his life was to earn a place for himself as a musician and win this angel for his wife this hope did more for him than the professor's counsels mrs joe's care or mr lorry's generous help for her sake he worked waited and hoped finding courage and patience in the dream of that happy future when daisy should make a little home for him and he fiddle a fortune into her lap mrs joe knew this and though he was not exactly the man she would have chosen for her niece she felt that nat would always need just the wise and loving care daisy could give him and that without it there was danger of his being one of the amiable and aimless men who fail for want of the right pilot to steer them safely through the world mrs meg decidedly frowned upon the poor boy's love and would not hear of giving her dear girl to any but the best man to be found on the face of the earth she was very kind but as firm as such gentle souls can be and nat fled for comfort to mrs joe who always espoused the interests of her boys heartily a new set of anxieties was beginning now that the aforesaid boys were growing up and she foresaw no end of worry as well as amusement in the love affairs already budding in her flock mrs meg was usually her best ally and adviser for she loved romances as well now as when a blooming girl herself but in this case she hardened her heart and would not hear a word of entreaty 
Nat was not man enough, never would be. No one knew his family. A musician's life was a hard one. Daisy was too young. Five or six years hence, when time had proved both, perhaps. Let us see what absence will do for him. And that was the end of it, for when the maternal pelican was roused she could be very firm, though for her precious children she would have plucked her last feather and given the last drop of her blood. Mrs. Joe was thinking of this as she looked at Nat, while he talked with her husband about Leipzig, and she resolved to have a clear understanding with him before he went, for she was used to confidences, and talked freely with her boys about the trials and temptations that beset all lives in the beginning, and so often mar them for want of the right word at the right moment. This is the first duty of parents, and no false delicacy should keep them from the watchful care, the gentle warning which makes self-knowledge and self-control the compass and pilot of the young as they leave the safe harbor of home. Plato and his disciples approach, announced irreverent Teddy, as Mr. March came in with several young men and women about him, for the wise old man was universally beloved, and ministered so beautifully to his flock that many of them thanked him all their lives for the help given to both hearts and souls. Bess went to him at once, for since Marmy died, Grandpapa was her special care, and it was sweet to see the golden head bend over the silver one as she rolled out his easy chair and waited on him with tender alacrity. Aesthetic tea always on tap here, sir. Will you have a flowing bowl or a bit of ambrosia? asked Lori, who was wandering about with a sugar basin in one hand and a plate of cake in the other, for sweetening cups and feeding the hungry was work he loved. Oh, neither, thanks. This child is taken care of me. And Mr. March turned to Bess, who sat on one arm of his chair, holding a glass of fresh milk. Long may she live to do it, sir and i be here to see this pretty contradiction of the song that youth and age cannot live together answered lorry smiling at the pair crabbed age papa that makes all the difference in the world said bess quickly for she loved poetry and read the best wouldst thou see fresh roses grow in a reverend bed of snow quoted mr march as josie came and perched on the other arm looking like a very thorny little rose for she had been having a hot discussion with ted and had got the worst of it grandpa most women always obey men and say they are the wisest just because they are the strongest she cried looking fiercely at her cousin who came stalking up with a provoking smile on the boyish face that was always very comical atop of that tall figure well my dear that is the old-fashioned belief and it will take some time to change it but i think the woman's hour has struck and it looks to me as if the boys must do their best, for the girls are abreast now, and may reach the goal first, answered Mr. March, surveying with paternal satisfaction the bright faces of the young women who were among the best students in the college. The poor little Atalantists are sadly distracted and delayed by the obstacles thrown in their way. Not golden apples by any means, but I think they will stand a fair chance when they have learned to run better, laughed Uncle Lorry, stroking Josie's breezy hair, which stood up like the fur of an angry kitten. Whole barrels of apples won't stop me when I start, and a dozen Teds won't trip me up, though they may try. I'll show him that a woman can act as well, if not better, than a man. It has been done, and will be again and i'll never own that my brain isn't as good as his though it may be smaller cried the excited young person if you shake your head in that violent way you'll addle what brains you've got and i'd take care of him if i were you began teasing ted what started this civil war asked grandpapa with a gentle emphasis on the adjective which caused the combatants to calm their ardor a little why, we were pegging away at the Iliad and came to where Zeus tells Juno not to inquire into his plans or he'll whip her, 
and Joe was disgusted because Juno meekly hushed up. I said it was all right and agreed with the old fellow that women didn't know much not to obey men, explained Ted to the great amusement of his hearers. Goddesses may do as they like, but those Greek and Trojan women were poor spirited things if they minded men who couldn't fight their own battles and had to be hustled off by Pallas and Venus and Juno when they were going to get beaten. The idea of two armies stopping and sitting down while a pair of heroes flung stones at one another. I don't think much of your old Homer. Give me Napoleon or Grant for my hero. Josie's scorn was as funny as if a hummingbird scolded at an ostrich, and everyone laughed as she sniffed at the immortal poet and criticized the gods. Napoleon's Juno had a nice time, didn't she? That's just the way girls argue, first one way and then the other, jeered Ted. Like Johnson's young lady, who was not categorical, but all wiggle-waggle added uncle lorry enjoying the battle immensely i was only speaking of them as soldiers but if you come to the woman's side of it wasn't grant a kind husband and mrs grant a happy woman he didn't threaten to whip her if she asked a natural question and if napoleon did do wrong about josephine he could fight and didn't want any minerva to come fussing over him they were a stupid set from dandified paris to achilles sulking in his ships and i won't change my opinion for all the hectors and agamemnons in greece said josie still unconquered you can fight like a trojan that's evident and we will be the two obedient armies looking on while you and ted have it out began uncle lorry assuming the attitude of a warrior leaning on his spear i fear we must give it up for Pallas is about to descend and carry off our Hector, said Mr. March, smiling, as Joe came to remind her son that supper time was near. We will fight it out later when there are no goddesses to interfere, said Teddy, as he turned away with unusual alacrity, remembering the treat in store. Conquered by a muffin, by Jove, called Josie after him, exulting in an opportunity to use the classical exclamation forbidden to her sex. But Ted shot a Parthian arrow as he retired in good order by replying, with a highly virtuous expression, Obedience is a soldier's first duty. Bent on her woman's privilege of having the last word, Josie ran after him, but never uttered the scathing speech upon her lips, for a very brown young man in a blue suit came leaping up the steps with a cheery, Ahoy! Ahoy! Where is everybody? Emil! Emil! cried Josie, and in a moment Ted was upon him, and the late enemies ended their fray in a joyful welcome to the newcomer muffins were forgotten and towing their cousin like two fussy little tugs with a fine merchantman the children returned to the parlor where emile kissed all the women and shook hands with all the men except his uncle him he embraced in the good old german style to the great delight of the observers didn't think i could get off to-day but found i could and steered straight for old plum not a soul there so i luffed and bore away for parnassus and here is every man jack of you bless your hearts how glad i am to see you all exclaimed the sailor boy beaming at them as he stood with his legs apart as if he still felt the rocking deck under his feet you ought to shiver your timbers not bless our hearts emile it's not nautical at all oh how nice and shippy and tarry do you smell said josie sniffing at him with great enjoyment of the fresh sea odors he brought with him this was her favorite cousin and she was his pet so she knew that the bulging pockets of the blue jacket contained treasures for her at least avast my hearty and let me take soundings before you dive laughed emile understanding her affectionate caresses and holding her off with one hand while with the other he rummaged out sundry foreign little boxes and parcels marked with different names and handed them round with appropriate remarks which caused much laughter for emile was a wag 
There's a hawser that will hold our little cockboat still about five minutes, he said, throwing a necklace of pretty pink coral over Josie's head. And here's something the mermaid sent to Undine, he added, handing Bess a string of pearly shells on a silver chain. I thought Daisy would like a fiddle, and Nat can find her a bow continued the sailor with a laugh as he undid a dainty filigree brooch in the shape of a violin i know she will and i'll take it to her answered nat as he vanished glad of an errand and sure that he could find daisy though emile had missed her emile chuckled and handed out a quaintly carved bear whose head opened showing a capacious inkstand this he presented with a scrape to aunt jo knowing your fondness for these fine animals i brought this one to your pen very good commodore try again said mrs jo much pleased with her gift which caused the professor to prophesy works of shakespeare from its depths so great would be the inspiration of the beloved bruin as aunt meg will wear caps in spite of her youth i got lamilla to get me some bits of lace hope you'll like em and out of a soft paper came some filmy things one of which soon lay like a net of snowflakes on mrs meg's pretty hair I couldn't find anything swell enough for Aunt Amy, because she has everything she wants. So I brought a little picture that always makes me think of her when Bess was a baby. And he handed her an oval ivory locket, on which was painted a golden-haired Madonna, with a rosy child folded in her blue mantle. How lovely! cried everyone, and Aunt Amy at once hung it about her neck on the blue ribbon from Bess's hair, charmed with her gift for it recalled the happiest year of her life now i flatter myself i've got just the thing for nan neat but not gaudy a sort of sign you see and very appropriate for a doctor said emile proudly displaying a pair of lava earrings shaped like little skulls horrid and bess who hated ugly things turned her eyes to her own pretty shells she won't wear earrings said josie well she'll enjoy punching your ears then she's never so happy as when she's overhauling her fellow creatures and going for em with a knife answered emile undisturbed i've got a lot of plunder for you fellows in my chest but i knew i should have no peace till my cargo for the girls was unloaded now tell me all the news and seated on amy's best marble-topped table the sailor swung his legs and talked at the rate of ten knots an hour till aunt jo carried them all off to a grand family tea in honor of the commodore end of chapter two Chapter Three of Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Three Aunt Joe's Last Scrape. The March family had enjoyed a great many surprises in the course of their varied career, but the greatest of all was when the ugly duckling turned out to be not a swan, but a golden goose, whose literary eggs found such an unexpected market that in ten years Joe's wildest and most cherished dream actually came true how or why it happened she never clearly understood but all of a sudden she found herself famous in a small way and better still with a snug little fortune in her pocket to clear away the obstacles of the present and assure the future of her boys it began during a bad year when everything went wrong at plumfield times were hard the school dwindled joe overworked herself and had a long illness lorry and amy were abroad and the bears too proud to ask help even of those as near and dear as this generous pair confined to her room joe got desperate over the state of affairs till she fell back upon the long disused pen as the only thing she could do to help fill the gaps of the income 
a book for girls being wanted by a certain publisher she hastily scribbled a little story describing a few scenes and adventures in the lives of herself and sisters though boys were more in her line and with very slight hopes of success sent it out to seek its fortune things always went by contraries with joe her first book labored over for years and launched full of the high hopes and ambitious dreams of youth foundered on its voyage though the wreck continued to float long afterward to the profit of the publisher at least the hastily written story sent away with no thought beyond the few dollars it might bring sailed with a fair wind and a wise pilot at the helm into public favor and came home heavily laden with an unexpected cargo of gold and glory a more astonished woman probably never existed than josephine bear when her little ship came into port with flags flying cannon that had been silent before now booming gaily and better than all many kind faces rejoicing with her many friendly hands grasping hers with cordial congratulations after that it was plain sailing and she merely had to load her ships and send them off on prosperous trips to bring home stores of comfort for all she loved and labored for the fame she never did quite accept for it takes very little fire to make a great deal of smoke nowadays and notoriety is not real glory the fortune she could not doubt and gratefully received though it was not half so large a one as a generous world reported it to be the tide having turned continued to rise and floated the family comfortably into a snug harbor where the older members could rest secure from storms and whence the younger ones could launch their boats for the voyage of life all manner of happiness peace and plenty came in those years to bless the patient waiters hopeful workers and devout believers in the wisdom and justice of him who sends disappointment poverty and sorrow to try the love of human hearts and make success the sweeter when it comes the world saw the prosperity and kind souls rejoiced over the improved fortunes of the family but the success joe valued most the happiness that nothing could change or take away few knew much about it was the power of making her mother's last years happy and serene to see the burden of care laid down forever the weary hands at rest the dear face untroubled by any anxiety and the tender heart free to pour itself out in the wise charity which was its delight as a girl joe's favorite plan had been a room where marmy could sit in peace and enjoy herself after her hard heroic life now the dream had become a happy fact and marmy sat in her pleasant chamber with every comfort and luxury about her loving daughters to wait on her as infirmities increased a faithful mate to lean upon and grandchildren to brighten the twilight of life with their dutiful affection a very precious time to all for she rejoiced as only mothers can in the good fortunes of their children she had lived to reap the harvest she sowed had seen prayers answered hopes blossom good gifts bear fruit peace and prosperity blessed the home she had made and then like some brave patient angel whose work was done turned her face heavenward glad to rest this was the sweet and sacred side of the change but it had its droll and thorny one as all things have in this curious world of ours after the first surprise incredulity and joy which came to joe with the ingratitude of human nature she soon tired of renown and began to resent her loss of liberty for suddenly the admiring public took possession of her and all her affairs past present and to come strangers demanded 
started to look at her question advise warn congratulate and drive her out of her wits by well-meant but very wearisome attentions if she declined to open her heart to them they reproached her if she refused to endow her pet charities relieve private wants or sympathize with every ill and trial known to humanity she was called hard-hearted selfish and haughty if she found it impossible to answer the piles of letters sent her she was neglectful of her duty to the admiring public and if she preferred the privacy of home to the pedestal upon which she was requested to pose the airs of literary people were freely criticized she did her best for the children they being the public for whom she wrote and labored stoutly to supply the demand always in the mouths of voracious youth more stories more right away her family objected to this devotion at their expense and her health suffered but for a time she gratefully offered herself up on the altar of juvenile literature feeling that she owed a good deal to the little friends in whose sight she had found favor after twenty years of effort but a time came when her patience gave out and wearying of being a lion she became a bear in nature as in name and returning to her den growled awfully when ordered out her family enjoyed the fun and had small sympathy with her trials but joe came to consider it the worst scrape of her life for liberty had always been her dearest possession and it seemed to be fast going from her living in a lantern soon loses its charm and she was too old too tired and too busy to like it she felt that she had done all that could reasonably be required of her when autographs photographs and autobiographical sketches had been sewn broadcast over the land when artists had taken her home in all its aspects and reporters had taken her in the grim one she always assumed on these trying occasions when a series of enthusiastic boarding schools had ravaged her grounds for trophies and a steady stream of amiable pilgrims had worn her doorsteps with their respectful feet when servants left after a week's trial of the bell that rang all day when her husband was forced to guard her at meals and the boys to cover her retreat out of back windows on certain occasions when enterprising guests walked in unannounced at unfortunate moments a sketch of one day may perhaps explain the state of things offer some excuse for the unhappy woman and give a hint to the autograph fiend now rampant in the land for it is a true tale there ought to be a law to protect unfortunate authors said mrs joe one morning soon after emile's arrival when the mail brought her an unusually large and varied assortment of letters to me it is a more wise and vital subject than international copyright for time is money peace is health and i lose both with no return but less respect for my fellow-creatures and a wild desire to fly into the wilderness since i cannot shut my doors even in free america lion hunters are awful when in search of their prey if they could change places for a while it would do them good and they'd see what bores they were when they do themselves the honor of calling to express their admiration of our charming work quoted ted with a bow to his parent now frowning over twelve requests for autographs i have made up my mind on one point said mrs joe with great firmness i will not answer this kind of letter i have sent at least six to this boy and he probably sells them this girl writes from a seminary and if i send her one all the other girls will at once write for more i'll begin by saying they know they intrude and that i am of course annoyed by these requests but they venture to ask because i like boys or they like the books and it is only one emerson and whittier put these things in their waste-paper basket and though only a literary nursery maid who provides moral pap for the young i will follow their illustrious example for i shall have no time to eat or sleep if i try to satisfy these dear unreasonable children 
and mrs joe swept away the entire batch with a sigh of relief i'll open the others and let you eat your breakfast in peace lee mutt said rob who often acted as her secretary here's one from the south and breaking an imposing seal he read madam as it has pleased heaven to bless your efforts with a large fortune i feel no hesitation in asking you to supply funds to purchase a new communion service for our church to what denomination you belong you will of course respond with liberality to such a request respectfully yours mrs x y xavier send a civil refusal dear all i have must go to feed and clothe the poor at my gates that is my thank offering for success go on answered his mother with a grateful glance about her happy home a literary youth of eighteen proposes that you put your name to a novel he has written and after the first edition your name is to be taken off and his put on there's a cool proposal for you i guess you won't agree to that in spite of your soft-heartedness towards most of the young scribblers couldn't be done tell him so kindly and don't let him send the manuscript i have seven on hand now and barely time to read my own said mrs joe pensively fishing a small letter out of the slop bowl and opening it with care because the downhill address suggested that a child wrote it i will answer this myself a little sick girl wants a book and she shall have it but i can't write sequels to all the rest to please her i should never come to an end if i tried to suit these voracious little oliver twists clamoring for more what next robin this is short and sweet dear mrs bear i am now going to give you my opinion of your works i have read them all many times and call them first-rate please go ahead your admirer billy babcock now that is what i like billy is a man of sense and a critic worth having since he has read my works many times before expressing his opinion he asks for no answer so send my thanks and regards here's a lady in england with seven girls and she wishes to know your views upon education also what careers they shall follow the oldest being twelve don't wonder she's worried laughed rob i'll try to answer it but as i have no girls my opinion isn't worth much and will probably shock her as i shall tell her to let them run and play and build up good stout bodies before she talks about careers they will soon show what they want if they are left alone and not all run in the same mould here's a fellow who wants to know what sort of a girl he shall marry and if you know of any like those in your stories give him nan's address and see what he'll get proposed ted privately resolving to do it himself if possible this is a lady from who wants you to adopt her child and lend her money to study art abroad for a few years better take it and try your hand at a girl mother no thank you i will keep to my own line of business what is that blotted one it looks rather awful to judge by the ink asked mrs joe who beguiled her daily task by trying to guess from the outside what was inside her many letters this proved to be a poem from an insane admirer to judge by its incoherent style to j m b o oh, were i a heliotrope i would play poet and blow a breeze of fragrance to you and none should know it your form like the stately elm when phoebus gilds the morning ray your cheeks like the ocean bed that blooms a rose in may your words are wise and bright i bequeath them to you a legacy given and when your spirit takes its flight may it bloom a flower in heaven my tongue in flattering language spoke and sweeter silence never broke in busiest street or loneliest glen i take with you the flashes of my pen consider the lilies how they grow they toil not yet are fair gems and flowers and solomon's seal the geranium of the world is j m bear james 
while the boy shouted over this effusion which is a true one their mother read several liberal offers from budding magazines for her to edit them gratis one long letter from a young girl inconsolable because her favorite hero died and would dear mrs bear rewrite the tale and make it end good another from an irate boy denied an autograph who darkly foretold financial ruin and loss of favor if she did not send him and all other fellows who asked autographs photographs and autobiographical sketches a minister wished to know her religion and an undecided maiden asked which of her two lovers she should marry these samples will suffice to show a few of the claims made on a busy woman's time and make my readers pardon mrs joe if she did not carefully reply to all that job is done now i will dust a bit and then get to my work i'm all behindhand and serials can't wait so deny me to everybody mary i won't see queen victoria if she comes to-day and mrs bear threw down her napkin as if defying all creation i hope the day will go well with thee my dearest answered her husband who had been busy with his own voluminous correspondence i will dine at college with professor pluck who is to visit us to-day the younglings can lunch on parnassus so thou shalt have a quiet time and smoothing the worried lines out of her forehead with his good-bye kiss the excellent man marched away both pockets full of books an old umbrella in one hand and a bag of stones for the geology class in the other if all literary women had such thoughtful angels for husbands they would live longer and write more perhaps that wouldn't be a blessing to the world though as most of us write too much now said mrs joe waving her feather duster to her spouse who responded with flourishes of the umbrella as he went down the avenue rob started for school at the same time looking so much like him with his books and bag and square shoulders and steady air that his mother laughed as she turned away saying heartily bless both my dear professors for better creatures never lived emile was already gone to his ship in the city but ted lingered to steal the address he wanted ravage the sugar bowl and talk with mum for the two had great larks together mrs joe always arranged her own parlor refilled her vases and gave the little touches that left it cool and neat for the day going to draw down the curtain she beheld an artist sketching on the lawn and groaned as she hastily retired to the back window to shake her duster at that moment the bell rang and the sound of wheels was heard in the road i'll go mary lets him in and ted smoothed his hair as he made for the hall can't see anyone give me a chance to fly upstairs whispered mrs joe preparing to escape but before she could do so a man appeared at the door with a card in his hand ted met him with a stern air and his mother dodged behind the window curtains to bide her time for escape i am doing a series of articles for the saturday tattler and i called to see mrs bear the first of all began the newcomer in the insinuating tone of his tribe while his quick eyes were taking in all they could experience having taught him to make the most of his time as his visits were usually short ones mrs bear never sees reporters sir but a few minutes will be all i ask said the man edging his way farther in you can't see her for she is out replied teddy as a backward glance showed him that his unhappy parent had vanished through the window he supposed as she sometimes did when hard bestead very sorry i'll call again is this her study charming room and the intruder fell back on the parlor bound to see something and bag a fact if he died in the attempt it is not said teddy gently but firmly backing him down the hall devoutly hoping that his mother had escaped round the corner of the house if you could tell me miss bear's age and birthplace date of marriage and number of children i will be much obliged continued the unabashed visitor as he tripped over the doormat 
She's about 60, born in Nova Zembla, married just 40 years ago today, and has 11 daughters. Anything else, sir? And Ted's sober face was such a funny contrast to his ridiculous reply that the reporter owned himself routed and retired laughing, just as a lady, followed by three beaming girls, came up the steps we are all the way from oshkosh and couldn't go home without seeing dear aunt joe my girls just admire her works and lot on getting a sight of her i know it's early but we are going to see holmes and longfeller and the rest of the celebrities so we ran out here first thing mrs erastus kingsbury pomerley of oshkosh tell her we don't mind waiting we can look round a spell if she ain't ready to see folks yet all this was uttered with such rapidity that Ted could only stand gazing at the buxom damsels, who fixed their six blue eyes upon him so beseechingly that his native gallantry made it impossible to deny them a civil reply at least. Mrs. Bear is not visible today. Out just now, I believe. But you can see the house and grounds if you like he murmured falling back as the four pressed in gazing rapturously about them oh thank you sweet pretty place i'm sure that's where she writes ain't it do tell me if that's her picture looks just as i imagined her with these remarks the ladies paused before a fine engraving of the honourable mrs norton with a pen in her hand and a rapt expression of countenance likewise a diadem and pearl necklace keeping his gravity with an effort teddy pointed to a very bad portrait of mrs joe which hung behind the door and afforded her much amusement it was so dismal in spite of a curious effect of light upon the end of the nose and cheeks as red as the chair she sat in this was taken for my mother but it is not very good he said enjoying the struggles of the girls not to look dismayed at the sad difference between the real and the ideal the youngest aged twelve could not conceal her disappointment and turned away feeling as so many of us have felt when we discover that our idols are very ordinary men and women i thought she'd be about sixteen and have her hair braided and two tails down her back i don't care about seeing her now said the honest child walking off to the hall door leaving her mother to apologize and her sisters to declare that the bad portrait was perfectly lovely so speaking and poetic you know specially about the brow come girls we must be going if we want to get through to-day you can leave your albums and have them sent when mrs bear has a written sentiment in em we are a thousand times obliged give our best love to your ma and tell her we are so sorry not to see her just as mrs erastus kingsbury parmalee uttered the words her eye fell upon a middle-aged woman in a large checked apron with a handkerchief tied over her head busily dusting an end room which looked like a study one peep at a sanctum since she is out <laughs> cried the enthusiastic lady and swept across the hall with her flock before teddy could warn his mother whose retreat had been cut off by the artist in front the reporter at the back of the house for he hadn't gone and the ladies in the hall they got her thought teddy in comical dismay no use for her to play housemaid since they've seen the portrait mrs joe did her best and being a good actress would have escaped if the fatal picture had not betrayed her mrs parmalee paused at the desk and regardless of the meerschaum that lay there the man's slippers close by and a pile of letters directed to professor f bear she clasped her hands exclaiming impressively girls this is the spot where she wrote those sweet those moral tales which have thrilled us to the soul could i ah uh, could i take one more soul of paper an old pen a postage stamp even as a memento of this gifted woman yes am help yourselves replied the maid moving away with a glance at the boy whose eyes were now full of merriment he could not suppress the oldest girl saw it guessed the truth and a quick look at the woman in the apron confirmed her suspicion touching her mother she whispered ma it's mrs bear herself 
I know it is. No? Yes? It is! Well, I do declare how nice that is! And hastily pursuing the unhappy woman who was making for the door, Mrs. Parmalee cried eagerly, Don't mind us. I know you're busy, but just let me take your hand and then we'll go. Giving herself up for lost, Mrs. Joe turned and presented her hand like a tea tray, submitting to having it heartily shaken, as the matron said, with somewhat alarming hospitality, If you ever come to Oshkosh, your feet won't be allowed to touch the pavement, for you'll be born in the arms of the populace. We shall be so dreadful glad to see you. Mentally resolving never to visit that effusive town, Jo responded as cordially as she could, and having written her name in the albums, provided each visitor with a memento, and kissed them all round, they at last departed, to call on Longfellow Holmes and the rest, who were all out, it is devoutly to be hoped. You villain! Why didn't you give me a chance to whip away? Oh, my dear! What fibs you told that man! I hope we shall be forgiven our sins in this line, but I don't know what is to become of us if we don't dodge. So many against one isn't fair play. And Mrs. Joe hung up her apron in the hall closet with a groan at the trials of her lot. More people coming up the avenue. Better dodge while the coast is clear. I'll head them off cried teddy looking back from the steps as he was departing to school mrs joe flew upstairs and having locked her door calmly viewed a young lady's seminary camp on the lawn and being denied the house proceed to enjoy themselves by picking the flowers doing up their hair eating lunch and freely expressing their opinion of the place and its possessors before they went a few hours of quiet followed, and she was just settling down to a long afternoon of hard work, when Rob came home to tell her that the young men's Christian union would visit the college, and two or three of the fellows whom she knew wanted to pay their respects to her on the way. It is going to rain, so they won't come, I dare say. But father thought you'd like to be ready in case they do call. You always see the boys, you know though you harden your heart to the poor girls said rob who had heard from his brother about the morning visitations boys don't gush so i can stand it the last time i let in a party of girls one fell into my arms and said darling love me i wanted to shake her answered mrs joe wiping her pen with energy you may be sure the fellows won't do it but they will want autographs so you'd better be prepared with a few dozen said rob laying out a choir of note-paper being a hospitable youth and sympathizing with those who admired his mother they can't outdo the girls at x college i really believe i wrote three hundred during the day i was there and i left a pile of cards and albums on my table when i came away it is one of the most absurd and tiresome manias that ever affected the world Nevertheless, Mrs. Joe wrote her name a dozen times, put on her black silk, and resigned herself to the impending call, praying for rain, however, as she returned to her work. The shower came, and feeling quite secure, she rumpled up her hair, took off her cuffs, and hurried to finish her chapter, for thirty pages a day was her task, and she liked to have it well done before evening. Josie had brought some flowers for the vases, and was just putting the last touches when she saw several umbrellas bobbing down the hill. "'They are coming, Auntie. I see Uncle hurrying across the field to receive them.' she called at the stair foot keep an eye on them and let me know when they enter the avenue it will take but a minute to tidy up and run down answered mrs joe scribbling away for dear life because cereals wait for no man not even the whole christian union en masse there are more than two or three i see half a dozen at least called sister anne from the hall door no a dozen i do believe auntie look out they are all coming what shall we do 
and Josie quailed at the idea of facing the black throng rapidly approaching. "'Mercy on us! There are hundreds. Run and put a tub in the back entry for their umbrellas to drip in. Tell them to go down the hall and leave them, and pile their hats on the table. The tree won't hold them all. No use to get mats. Oh, my poor carpets!' And down went Mrs. Joe to prepare for the invasion, while Josie and the maids flew about, dismayed at the prospect of so many muddy boots. On they came, a long line of umbrellas, with splashed legs and flushed faces underneath, for the gentlemen had been having a good time all over the town, undisturbed by the rain. Professor Bayer met them at the gate, and was making a little speech of welcome, when Mrs. Joe, touched by their bedraggled state, appeared at the door, beckoning them in. Leaving their host to orate bareheaded in the wet, the young men hastened up the steps, merry, warm, and eager, clutching off their hats as they came, and struggling with their umbrellas, as the order was passed to march in and stack arms tramp 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 down the hall went seventy-five pairs of boots soon seventy-five umbrellas dripped sociably in the hospitable tub while their owners swarmed all over the lower parts of the house and seventy-five hearty hands were shaken by the hostess without a murmur though some were wet some very warm and nearly all bore trophies of the day's ramble one impetuous party flourished a small turtle as he made his compliments another had a load of sticks cut from noted spots and all begged for some memento of plumfield a pile of cards mysteriously appeared on the table with a written request for autographs and despite her morning vow mrs joe wrote every one while her husband and boys did the honors of the house Josie fled to the back parlor, but was discovered by exploring youths, and mortally insulted by one of them, who innocently inquired if she was Mrs. Bear. The reception did not last long, and the end was better than the beginning, for the rain ceased, and a rainbow shone beautifully over them, as the good fellows stood upon the lawn singing sweetly for a farewell. A happy omen, that bow of promise arched over the young heads, as if heaven smiled upon their union, and showed them that above the muddy earth and rainy skies the blessed sun still shone for all three cheers and then away they went leaving a pleasant recollection of their visit to amuse the family as they scraped the mud off the carpets with shovels and emptied the tub half full of water nice honest hard-working fellows and i don't begrudge my half-hour at all i must finish so don't let anyone disturb me till tea-time said mrs joe leaving mary to shut up the house for papa and the boys had gone off with the guests and josie had run home to tell her mother about the fun at aunt joe's peace reigned for an hour then the bell rang and mary came giggling up to say a queer kind of lady wants to know if she can catch a grasshopper in the garden a what cried mrs joe dropping her pen with a blot for of all the odd requests ever made this was the oddest a grasshopper ma'am i said you was busy and asked what she wanted and says she i've got grasshoppers from the grounds of several famous folks and i want one from plumfield to add to my collection did you ever and mary giggled again at the idea tell her to take all there are and welcome i shall be glad to get rid of them always bouncing in my face and getting into my dress laughed mrs joe mary retired to return in a moment nearly speechless with merriment she's much obliged ma'am and she'd like an old gown or a pair of stockings of yours to put in a rug she's making got a vest of emerson's she says and a pair of mr holmes trousers and a dress of mrs stowe's she must be crazy <sighs> give her that old red shawl then i shall make a gay show among the great ones in that astonishing rug yes they are all lunatics these lion hunters but this seems to be a harmless maniac 
for she doesn't take my time and gives me a good laugh said mrs joe returning to her work after a glance from the window which showed her a tall thin lady in rusty black skipping wildly to and fro on the lawn in pursuit of the lively insect she wanted no more interruptions till the light began to fade then mary popped her head in to say a gentleman wished to see mrs bear and wouldn't take no for an answer he must i shall not go down this has been an awful day and i won't be disturbed again replied the harassed authoress pausing in the midst of the grand finale of her chapter i told him so ma'am but he walked right in as bold as brass i guess he's another crazy one and i declare i'm most afraid of him he's so big and black and cool as cucumbers though i will say he's good-looking added mary with a simper for the stranger had evidently found favor in her sight despite his boldness my day has been ruined and i will have this last half hour to finish tell him to go away i won't go down cried mrs joe fiercely mary went and listening in spite of herself her mistress heard first a murmur of voices then a cry from mary and remembering the ways of reporters also that her maid was both pretty and timid mrs bear flung down her pen and went to the rescue descending with her most majestic air she demanded in an awe-inspiring voice as she paused to survey the somewhat brigandish intruder who seemed to be storming the staircase which mary was gallantly defending who is this person who insists on remaining when i have declined to see him i'm sure i don't know ma'am he won't give no name and says you'll be sorry if you don't see him answered mary retiring flushed and indignant from her post won't you be sorry asked the stranger looking up with a pair of black eyes full of laughter the flash of white teeth through a long beard and both hands out as he boldly approached the irate lady mrs joe gave one keen look for the voice was familiar then completed mary's bewilderment by throwing both arms round the brigand's neck exclaiming joyfully my dearest where did you come from california on purpose to see you mother bear now won't she be sorry if i go away answered dan with a hearty kiss to think of my ordering you out of the house when i've been longing to see you for a year laughed mrs joe and she went down to have a good talk with her returned wanderer who enjoyed the joke immensely End of chapter three